Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series has been on the promise, God's everlasting covenant. And this is the last lesson in that series entitled, The New Covenant Life. It's lesson number 13 for June 26 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we look forward to that day when you will show up in the clouds and be prepared to take your faithful children home with you. What a marvelous possibility. What a, we, we, our minds can't even begin to comprehend the things that you have prepared. But now we're still here. Help us to know what we need to do in preparation is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How reliable are God's promises? How long will God's promise last if it is described as everlasting? If God has promised us a way to salvation and eternal life, shouldn't that be an important thing to study? But we need to recognize that God's promises are not just for some time in eternity, but they also have important implications for right now. So, let me ask you, do you feel the joy of trusting God's promise? I'll let you out there think about it while we think about it here. Do you feel a burden of guilt? Do you think God can remove that guilt? And what does it mean to have a new heart? Those are some of the issues we'll be looking at and trying to figure out as we study this particular lesson. And I will tell you that uh, this lesson is taking what is considered to be a very Protestant approach to the subject of salvation. And the, the, the idea that God looks at our records and he ha we have to get the, the records of the past cleared away before we, we have to end up with a clean slate so that we're safe to save. And I think there's more to the story of salvation than that. So let's Except see what... Except they don't say safe to save, they just no. say saved. Yes. I would like to suggest to you that there's absolutely no higher privilege than becoming partners with, God, with the divine nature. Now you say, hold on, wait, 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 wait. Partners with the divine nature? Partakers. Partakers even. Yeah. What is that about, Jim? He, that is Jesus, did not consent to sin. Not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and he came to make, make us partakers of the divine nature. So long as we are united in him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ that we may attain to perfection of character. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 123. And I want to notice very carefully, and Ellen White supports this in a number of different passages, that's not our job. God is the one who has the capacity to make the changes in our lives. We, but we have to, we have to cho choose to let him do it. That's, that's our part. It has often been thought that Christians are sad and weary and trudging their way towards some future goal. In light of that idea, how do we understand 1 John 1, 1 to 4, Carrie? We write to you about the word of life, which has existed from the very beginning. We have heard it and we have seen it with our eyes. Yes, we have seen it and our hands have touched it. Now I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. Why does he start out like, this is the very first verses in, in this letter. Why does he start out like that? Do you have an idea? Do you remember what the, the common belief were, beliefs were in those days, thanks to um, Aristotle and Socrates? I don't know who, who got it, came up with the idea first. Maybe it was even, it was the guy with the starts with a P. Plato. Plato, Plato, I think he might have been the first one. Okay, but remember his idea, the idea that was pro prevalent in those days was if it's solid and you can touch it, if it's real, 
then that's evil. If you, anything that's good, you can't touch it. The ephemeral is out there and it's good, and and, and that would include the, the the soul that's inside the suke that's inside you. That's good, but your body is evil. So we have a good soul, you know, in prison in a, in an evil body. So John is saying here. Let me tell you. I'm going to tell you about the Son of God, God Himself, and you could touch Him, you could see Him. It, he was real. Okay, Carrie, go ahead. We have seen it with our eyes. Yes, we have seen it, and our hands have touched it. When this life became visible, we saw it. So we speak of it and tell you about the eternal life, which was under, the, which was with the Father, rather, and was made known to us. What we have seen and heard we announce to you also so that you will join with us in the fellowship that we have with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this in order that our joy may be complete. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. We write this so that what? That your joy can be Our joy may be complete. What is he suggesting? Only True Christians have real joy, okay? The feelings of joy connected with our surrender to Christ are not a temporary flight of feeling or emotion. It's not some kind of mood. Whether we like it or not, we are human, we humans are creatures of feelings. That, that describes us, whether we like it or not. So in light of all that, what would it mean to have joy that is complete? Think of the story of the disciple John. What do, we, what do you know? John apparently began following Jesus very early in his life. Uh, may have been only a teenager, we don't know for sure. Um, he spent most of the, after Jesus began his ministry, John joined him. Apparently John was one of John's, John Baptist's disciples before Jesus showed up. And he joined Jesus very early it was a while before Jesus actually called him and the others to be, to be his disciples, but they, they were following him a long time before that. And he felt so close to Jesus that he came to be called the beloved disciple. Now, someone's going to say, ah, oh, but he's the one who says he was the beloved disciple. Yeah, that's true, but what's he, what's he saying? What he's saying is that, believe it or not, Jesus, God himself, kept loving me. He didn't stop, he didn't give up on me, he kept loving me. I think that's pretty impressive. Some scholars believe that John was actually a cousin of Jesus. And there's some hints of that in the New Testament. If you compare the, all four of the Gospels together, it's a little bit tricky and you know we can't be sure, but it's quite possible. That might be supported by this comment by Ellen White. Myra? He, Jesus had been separated from his mother for quite a length of time. During this period, he had been baptized by John and had endured the temptations in the wilderness. Rumors had reached Mary concerning her son and his sufferings. Now I can, let me interrupt for a second. There must have been some pretty good Bush telegraph going on back in those days. How did she, she's way up in Nazareth. How did she hear, this is way down, even on the other side of Jordan out there and but apparently, she, she, the, word, the word got around. Yeah. Someone okay. texted her. Yeah, someone texted yeah, her. I think there was more movement amongst population than we give them credit for. Yeah. But yeah. Even, yeah. even just walking there took several days. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. But, but we know how telephone, the game telephone works. Uh-huh. Okay. So it, the message changes with each time you tell yeah. it? Yes, sir. It could. Okay. Okay, go ahead. John, one of the new disciples, had searched for Christ and had found him in his humiliation, emancipated, emaciated, em, emaciated sorry, and bearing the marks of great physical and mental distress. Now let's be clear here. We're talking about Jesus during those 40 days out in the wilderness, and John went looking for him and found him. Yes. You know, that's not discussed very much. That it John is not. Very few people are aware of it at all. Yeah. Anyway, Jesus, unwilling that John should witness him, he, witness his humiliation, 
had gently yet firmly dismissed him from his presence. He wished to be alone. No human eye must behold his agony. No human heart be called out in sympathy with his distress. It's from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 99.2. And for those of you who are in favor and love reading the writings of Ellen White, uh, that four-volume series called The Spirit of Prophecy has some marvelous, marvelous information in it, and this was just one of those. Is so it that, what? that idea didn't transfer to, through to the Desire of Ages? It did not. Remember that the Desire of Ages was intended for the general population. And so this information, she would have known only because of her visions. Of She saw it in vision. And she tried to not, I mean, she, she introduces a lot of ideas, even in Desire of Ages, that, that uh, you know, are not stated from the Bible. That she, she fills out the stories. But this is far enough off of, you know, the story that uh, she apparently felt that it didn't need to be included. Mm. So is it possible for today for us to have the kind of relationship with Jesus that John had? We can't travel with him, you know, following his footsteps. And who, who was fo following him, by the way, uh, and all those journeys in Galilee and so forth? Do we know how, what people were following him? This is not a trick question. Well, it got to the point where it was the Pharisees and, and spies that were following okay. him, as well as disciples. And okay, who were the people disciples? People who wanted to be healed. We had 12 disciples and people were trying to get healed. There's some other specific, another specific group. The women. The women. Yeah, very important. Luke, Luke 8, 1 to 3, it talks about that. Some very important women were following as well. So, so what kind of relationship could we have with Jesus by exercising faith? And what does faith mean? That means we have a close <laughs> relationship with Jesus. Does that relationship give you joy? Romans 8, 1 tells us, there's no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. No condemnation. So now, are you worried about the condemnation? Why would that be true? We're talking about guilt here, right? Contrast this story. A young woman had been brutally murdered, her killer unknown. The police, setting a trap, placed a hidden microphone in her grave. One evening, many months after her death, a young man approached the grave and kneeling and weeping, begged the woman for forgiveness. The police, of course, monitoring his words, nabbed him for the crime. What drove the man to the grave? Guilt. That's from our adult, it's quoted in our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide from Monday, June 21. Fortunately, few of us ever find ourselves in that kind of a situation. But do we suffer from guilt? Are we guilty for other reasons? Are we able to experience the freedom that God's love offers us? Do we really believe that God can take away our guilt? What does it mean to suggest that God treats us as if we were not guilty? That's in several passages in the scripture. What can we learn from the following verses about how God treats those who come to him? Jim? John 5, 24, Jesus said, I am telling you the truth. Those who hear my words and believe in him who sent me have eternal life. They will not be judged, but they have already passed from death to life. Good news Bible. So what does that mean? Passed from death to life. Hmm. Romans 3, 24 to 26. But by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with him through Jesus Christ, who sets them free. God offered him so that by his blood, footnote, by his blood or by his sacrificial death, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did not in order to demonstrate. No, God did this. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins. 
But in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In that way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. Good News Bible. And one more short one. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5, 21. Christ was without sin, but for our sake, God made him share our sin in order to, that in union with him, we might share the righteousness of God. Good News Bible. Okay, now let's, let's talk about the serious implications of all of that. What does it mean to suggest that he shares our sin? Was Jesus the sinner? No. no. How can we say that he shares our sins? Well, he suffers the consequences of, of other people's uh, okay. misdeeds. And we share his righteousness. Do we share his righteousness? Well, if eventually. we... Uh, yeah. Maybe, eventually, yeah. Okay. We, see, we still have the opportunity to observe, uh, uh, in our position, uh, read about him, and uh, see if that uh, has some impact on our, our thinking. Okay, so it's important that we recognize what it means when we say we share our sins with him. What that really means is that Jesus agreed to take upon himself the consequences of our sins, and he died what we call the second death, the death that results from separation from God. That's what happened. Jesus took upon himself the consequences of our sins. Now, he didn't have to be a sinner in order to do that. God had to simply say, okay, according to the agreement that we made back before this world was created, the two of us are going to separate ourselves. Okay? Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Jesus died of separation from his Father. Do we worry about being separated from the Father? Every time we commit a sin, we're voluntarily choosing to separate ourselves from the Father. And Jesus, it was, it was so horrible for him to feel himself being separated from the Father that he sweat drops of blood, and finally on the cross, it literally killed him. Are we, are, we, are, we, are we really taking that all in? Do we really understand that input information? We know Is that, that. to suggest that at the, in the end we would sweat drops of blood if we are separated from God? If we're separated from God, that's possible, yes. And that separation from God, what's the other name for it? The second death. The second death. We're going to talk about that more in just a moment. I don't think there's anyone here. I'm not going to ask anyone to bear their soul and confess their guilt. But guilt hangs on to us. I, you know, we can remember things. I remember things I did that I shouldn't have done when I was a tiny, young, a young kid. And I'm sure you can too. It's hard to forget something evil that we did even by accident. I can remember once or twice I broke things that I, was, I wasn't paying attention, that wasn't intentional, but I broke something and, oh no, can I put this together again? What can I do about this? You know? We are all sinners. There's no question about that. Romans 3.23, I'm sorry, yeah, Romans 3.23. We can never deny that, but are we willing to look forward to a life with Christ and leave behind our guilt and sinful life of the past? That's hard to imagine. It's hard to, to the imagine. point where you don't remember or feel that pang of sadness. We're going we're gonna to talk about that in, in a little bit. I want to I hold on a little bit more before we really try to dig deep into that. Gary, I think you're next. Okay, I'm reading Romans chapter 8, verse 3. What the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own Son, who came with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. That's from the Good News Bible. Yeah. So how does Jesus deal with our sins? What is he doing? standing in the presence of the Father. 
Now, you know what most people believe? He's up there, the Father really is, he, he's upset, and he's just ready to zap us and just say, oh no, Father, please, my blood, my blood. Is that what's really happening? Mm. Well, look at a couple of verses straight from the Bible, a couple of passages. Myra? From Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. I'm going to interrupt for a second again. Show me the high priest Joshua. Why is he talking about Joshua? Joshua, Joshua. was the high priest at that time. Joshua. Not Joshua of Caleb this is not, and Joshua. Yeah, this is not Joshua of the book of Joshua. This is a Joshua who lived many years later, who was the high priest among the children of Israel who had returned, or the uh, the children, actually the Jews who had returned from Babylon back to Jerusalem. So he represents everybody. Remember, it's the high priest that's supposed to carry the sins into the sanctuary and then carry them out and put them on the scapegoat. So he's the representative of all the people in those days, okay? Okay. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. Now, do I need to ask you what filthy, filthy clothes refer to? What that was that mean? Well, I don't know. When we're talking about the high priest, you wouldn't think of Joshua's. Well, he had sin. Yes. yes. Uh, filthy, filthy clothes, clothes represented re sin. Yeah, the filthy clothes represent sins. Okay. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I've taken away your sin and give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put on a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there in the Good News Bible. Okay. And what's the rest of that story? What else is going on? In Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, while I, was looking this, while I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire and the stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. Okay, these are two of the most direct quotations in the entire Bible about how the judgment actually takes place. There's some very good passages in, in, in John 3 and 5 and 12 as well, but these are very clear and pertinent. So notice three very important things in these two passages. One, who's doing the accusing? Satan. It's not the Father accusing sinners. It is Satan who is accusing sinners, including us. We are being accused by Satan. We are being accused of sins that are caused by who? Originally by Satan. He's the one who caused those sins. He's the one who tempted us to do those things, and now he's accusing us of doing the things that he's tempted us to do. Two, how does Jesus respond when Satan ex accuses us? Jesus condemns Satan. I, I want that to be very clear in your mind. It says right there, go back and read it if you're not, maybe I should go back up there and just show here. In Joshua 3, verse Ze two. Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3, Z verse Zechariah 2. 3, verse 2. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. It can't be any more direct and straightforward than that. So, the Lord condemn you, Satan. Three, then Jesus goes about removing our past sin and covering us with brand new clothes. And we already read in Romans 8, what does he do? He deals with our sin. It doesn't say there's some kind of elaborate process of shedding blood and all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that the, the blood isn't important for what it represents, but in Zechariah 3, it's just take the sins away. Take them away. How does, it, how does that fit? 
And really important, I should have put this as number four probably, this takes place in the presence of millions of beings from the rest of the universe, all of whom are very interested in what kind of people God is planning to bring back to heaven. So who's really concerned? Is God learning anything from this judgment? He knows it all already. He knows it all already. Jesus knows it all. The Father knows it all. The Holy Spirit knows it all. Who doesn't know? The millions of beings looking on and watching. They want to know. They want to see the evidence. And God's government is perfectly transparent. So he says, here's the evidence. Look for yourself. So we know from a scripture again, God is forgiveness personified. Jesus forgave the men who are nailing him to the cross even though they had not asked for forgiveness. You can read about that in um, Luke 23, 42, I believe it is. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19 from the Good News Bible. And I pray that Christ will make his home in your hearts through faith. I pray that you may have your roots and foundation in love so that you, together with all God's people, may have the power to understand how broad and long, how high and deep is Christ's love. Yes, may you come to know his love, although it can never be fully known, and so be completely filled with the very nature of God. Wow. Okay, what, I wonder if that has something to do with being completely filled with joy that we read about earlier. So how does God write his law in our hearts? That seems to be the key, one of the key elements. How does he treat us after that happens? This is a passage that we have gone back to again and again and again. It's because it is the definition of the new, new covenant, and this whole quarter is about covenants. The Lord says a time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Remember, God offered that covenant to them and they promised, oh yes, we'll do, we'll do, we'll do. That's uh, Exodus 19 and 24. This time the new covenant says, I will make, God talking, I will make, oh, I'm sorry, although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizens to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. So what's the, what's the key there? Everyone will know God. And that's from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Right, in my Good News Bible. Notice who is doing the promising. It's all God's doing the promising, right? Well, do we really need a new heart? And what difference would that make? Jim? The words, a new heart will I give you, mean a new mind will I give you. This change of heart is always attended by a clear conception of a Christian duty and understanding of truth. The clearness of our views of truth will be pr proportionate to our understanding of the Word of God. He who gives the scriptures close prayerful attention will gain clear comprehension and sound judgment, as if in turning to God he had reached a higher grade of intelligence. Ellen White, Review and Herald, November 10, 1904. Wow, a higher grade of intelligence. Anybody would like to have a higher grade of intelligence? Hmm. <laughs> it would be hard to reject. Yeah. Well, God is interested in establishing permanent, close, loving relationship with every one of us. When that happens, our lives, our hearts, quote unquote, are changed. We become new people with new thoughts, new desires, new goals, and the opportunity to look forward to an eternity of glorious bliss. Okay, so marvelous things happening now and a marvelous promise for the future, right? Way, way, way back in the days of Moses, Jesus gave 
him two rules. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And those rules are found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, 18. Jesus himself repeated those rules in Matthew 22, 37 to 39. And what does that kind of love mean? Just before you read that, let's think about that for a moment. Did Jesus ever say to those people, by the way, I was the one who said that to Moses? <laughs> he should have, shouldn't he? I, I wish he, maybe we'll find out someday that he did. He probably would have gotten killed earlier if he'd had done that. Maybe so, they would have. Well, they tried, they were trying to kill him from, from, from the very first Passover. I mean, it, from the very first Passover in his ministry. It says right there in John, they, they wanted to kill him. Kerry, let's talk about the love. All right, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I may be able to speak the languages of human beings and even of angels, but if I have no love, my speech is no more than a noisy gong or a clanging bell. I may have the gift of inspired preaching. I may have all knowledge and understand all secrets. I may have all the faith needed to move mountains, but if I love no one, I am nothing. I may give away everything I have and even give up my body to be burnt. There's a footnote there, 13.3 to be burnt. Some manuscripts, manuscripts rather, have an order to boast. There's, there's a slight difference in the spelling there that, yeah. okay. But if I have no love, this does me no good. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up, and its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. There are inspired messages, but they are temporary. There are gifts of speaking in strange tongues, but they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass. For our gifts of knowledge and of inspired messages are only partial. But when what is perfect comes, then what is partial will disappear. When I was a child, my speech, feelings, and thinkings were all those of a child. Now that I have grown up, I have no more use for childish ways. What we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. Meanwhile, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, from the Good News Bible. Wow, so that's a famous passage that probably many of you memorized at some time in the past when you were in school, if you went to a Christian school. Is it really possible to have that kind of love in our lives? What do you think? Yes. What changes might you need, we need to make in order to have that happen? Of course, God's promises do not end with a life on this earth. Christians can live through all kinds of difficulties, sufferings, trials, and torture, but they have a glorious promise that even beyond the grave, God has an eternal, wonderful kingdom for them to inherit. I had, a, had the privilege of studying a person who, who made a very strong point of that. He says, we need to live in light of the reality. No matter what happens to us right now, so long as we remain with that solid connection to God, the reality is this what's coming. The final result is we'll have a heavenly home. So what happens now, it, it may be bad, it may, you know, it may be painful, it may be, you know, facing lies and, and untruths and who knows what, torture. But the reality is we know where we're going. I think we need to keep that in mind. Jesus wanted that truth to be so impressed on our minds that he said to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who was at that point dead in the tomb. Okay, let's be clear about that. What did he say to her? John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Those who believe in me will live. Even though they die, all those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Good News Bible. How could this be true? Never die? What was Jesus talking about? John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. From the Good News Bible. And then John 6, 39, Jesus further said, And, the, and it is the will of him who sent me that I should not lose any of all those he has given me, but that I should rise with them raise, all. Raise them all. That I should raise them all to life on that last day. So that's the, that's the future goal. That's where we're going if we're in, in, in step with Jesus Christ. So whatever happens on the way might be unpleasant, but that's where we're going. God does not regard the first death as something serious because he's planning to raise all those people to life again when they even when they die the first death with God what God is concerned about is that terrible second death which is a direct result of sin which separates us from God the only source of life Isaiah 59 verse 2 and other places Romans 6 23 and that is why no one needs to die if she or he has faith in Jesus and trusts Jesus. That is, they, they don't need to die what? The second, the second death. Okay? Revelation 20, 6 and 14. Happy and greatly blessed are those who are included in this first raising of the dead. The second death, that's the one that really matters, has no power over them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they will rule with him for a thousand years. Then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And then in Romans, I'm sorry, Revelation 21, verse 8, the one who sits on the throne said, but cowards, traitors, perverts, murderers, the immoral, those who practice magic, those who worship idols, and all liars, the place for them is a lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is second. the second death. So we get to choose. Do we want to have life eternal? Do we want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, or do we want to find ourselves thrown into the lake of fire? Well, think about it then. When we lie down at night and put our heads on the pillow, we don't worry about the fact that we are about to sleep. A lot of us think that's a marvelous <laughs> opportunity. We do not need to if we have the right kind of relationship with God. We do not need to worry if we have to lay our head down to death. It is simply asleep in God's eyes. But if we lie down in death and we have been faithful, then when we arise, it will be a, in a totally new body. We will experience in the twinkling of an eye immortality. Think of that. It will not be natural for us, of course, but it will be given to us by God. Jim? Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. It is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave, not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but, through, but because through faith, his life has become ours. Those who, excuse me, those who see in his see true Christ. character. See Christ in his true character. Those who, okay, those who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal. Be beginning, yeah. Uh, Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 388. Well, so here's a package. God promised us eternal joy. He promised us eternal life. He promised us that there's going to be some speed bumps between now and then. This isn't just easy all the way. That who, who's responsible for the speed bumps? Satan. Satan is going to do everything he possibly can to discourage us, to thwart our plans, to turn to us to the side. 
out of the way of path of God's way, but think about it. Have you experienced happiness and joy of having a complete trust in God so that you'll be, you will experience eternal life no matter how bad things may be on this earth in any given situation? Christians realize that their ultimate fate is not here. Now that's not quite true. After the thousand years in heaven, where are we going to come back to? Here. Here. The truth is that they have an everlasting life that will be theirs one day. This is the ultimate reality. Okay? That's the end of the story. It's really the end of a story that doesn't end. And that blessed hope comes to us because of that fabulous Sunday when Christ rose from the grave. What a glorious resurrection. The man who can raise himself from the dead will not have any trouble raising his friends. But God does not give us all this joy, hope, and promise just so we can sit at home and enjoy it. What's the plan? Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Jesus said, Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age, from the Good News Bible. Now that, that's, a, that's a instructions just given for the pastors, right? Yeah. Well, that directly was given to the disciples. Well, but hold on, go back and look at it. It was, if you, if you read what it says at the end of John and, and in Desire of Ages, there was a group of more than 500 who received these words. But it wasn't said to me. Oh, well, uh, well okay, you no, can leave yourself it. out if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, God... The Bible makes it to me, huh? Yes. John 17, Jesus' last prayer, makes it very clear that we're all supposed to be involved. Do you ever wonder if your life has any meaning? That's one of the, the real questions. We talked about that in an earlier lesson. Life without meaning is pretty, a pretty sad situation. Do you feel that you are accomplishing something? Have you ever had the privilege of leading someone to Jesus Christ? I, one of, my, one of the times in my life when I attended a non-Adventist school was at Johns Hopkins University doing my master's in public health. And while I was there, I had the privilege of talking to a young woman who was one of my classmates and leading her to become a faithful Seventh-day Adventist. She came, we, I invited her to church, come to church one Sabbath. She showed up and never stopped. And that's just marvelous to think back to. But that had, wasn't the first contact inviting her to church. You'd had no, a long conversation with her before that, right? It started with a question that she asked me. She, um, we were in, a, we were in a, a room together with a group of friends, and I was just being introduced to some of them because I hadn't met most of them. And I was introduced to her and another lady that was with her, who was one of my teachers. And she turned to me and completely out of the blue, I had no idea why she said this. She said, if you're 500 miles away from somebody who is in a coma, in a serious car accident, they, they can't talk on the phone, you can't see them, you can't do anything. If you pray for them, will it do any good? You can't go there. I said, that's not an easy question. She says, I know the answers to the easy questions. <laughs> and they were immediate like that. She didn't a second. She just responded like that. So I had, to, I had my, my work set out for me. And we, we spent a number of times looking through the Bible, answering questions. And then I asked her to come to church, and that's what happened. That which Jesus offers us will be pain-free, trouble-free, and full of joy and peace forever. How can we argue with that? More than that, if we, with the help of the Holy Spirit, have managed to convince someone to come to Jesus, we can bring rejoicing to heaven. Luke 15, 7 and 10. 
Uh, in the same way, I tell you that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who don't, do not need to repent. In the same way, I tell you, verse 10, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. So, would you like to make heaven rejoice? Would there be anything better to do in our lives than to work in co cooperation with the Holy Spirit, with God and Jesus, to prepare our world for, world for the second coming? Are we prepared to follow Christ's commands? And look, no, notice those commands, four of them. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach. Those are the four commands. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Every Christian is given the commission to do these things. Have we been doing them, and can we do more? I mean, think about it. Now, we today have some certain rules about who can baptize, and so we have, we've sort of organized this in some ways, but that doesn't mean that we all shouldn't be out there trying to do our best to make this happen. We believe that Jesus has bridged the gulf between earth and heaven. With one arm, he, gra one arm, he grasps the throne of God. With the other, he reaches down to us and he says, Jim? Come, my brother, come as you are, sinful and polluted. Lay your burden of guilt on Jesus and by faith claim his merits. Come now, while mercy lingers, come with confession, come with contrition of soul, and God will abundantly pardon. Do not dare to slight another opportunity. Listen to the voice of mercy that now pleads with you to arise from the dead that Christ may give you light. Every moment now seems to connect itself directly with the destinies of the unseen world. Then let not your pride and unbelief lead you to still further reject offered mercy. If you do, you will be left to lament at the last. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Ellen White, Testimonies wow. of the Church, Volume 5, page 353. Mm. Those who have not experienced the Christian life have a very different understanding of life and our place in the universe. Carrie? We see ourselves in relation to the cosmos, wrote Francisco Jose Moreno, and we are aware of our ignorance and final powerlessness, hence our insecurity. As a result, we fear between, Go ahead. between faith and reason, basic fear and the human condition. And that's from New York Harper and Rowe Publishers, quoted in an Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Does that sound like a wonderful life completely filled with the very nature of God? <laughs> Not at all. What does it actually mean to be filled with the fullness of God? Or to be, quote, completely filled with the very nature of God? Look at what Jesus said to his disciples. John 10, 10. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. Remember the King James says, more abundantly. Many human philosophers have looked at the universe and at the world in which we live and decried meaninglessness, lack of hope, and fear. From the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has quoted this. The life of a man, said David Hume lamented, is of no greater importance to the universe than that of an oyster. Wow. So, if you partake of the theory of evolution, he's saying, okay, we may be further down the line, but we're, we're really no different than an oyster. Obviously. I think I am. You think you are? I think all of us are. Yeah. Marvelous. Obviously, the, the, these are the words of someone who has not experienced Christianity. Humanity is so important that the God who created the universe became part of it. Compared to what it took to make the universe in the first place, becoming part of it would be easy. The one whose creation is measured in, measured in light years 
shrank into someone measured in feet and inches. Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 171. I mean, think about that, the <laughs> light years, and now he's shrinking himself down to our size. Wow. So how do you understand these following words? Jim? And faith, like a chariot wheel rolls to the portion of grace. To believe in Christ means to believe that Christ's death possesses the omnipotence to eradicate every past sin. This is called justification by faith. To believe on Christ means to believe that the paraclete, the cosmic comforter, to Christ's priesthood can impart omnipotent, excuse omnipotent. me, omnipresent grace to overcome our character deficiencies. This is called sanctification by faith. To believe Christ simply means that to trust his omnip omniscience, it means to lean the, ent the entire personality on the flawless, life-changing mind and character of the resurrection and the life. Yes, we are saved by grace, but faith is the bus that bus ride that transports us to the venue of grace. Now I'm going to notice that each one of those steps involves faith. Justification by faith, sanctification by faith, salvation by faith. I don't know how many times we need to repeat this. So the key is what? Faith. And faith is just a word we use to describe that special relationship that we may have with Jesus Christ ourselves. And that's what he wants from us. If we're willing to let him into our lives, to let him into our thinking, to read the scriptures, to study his word, then he enters and he's the one who can make the changes in us. Once again, we remind you that justification is by faith, sanctification is by faith, salvation is by faith. So what we need to attain is a clear understanding of faith. We need to have that kind of relationship with God that transforms lives. Gary? Throughout the New Testament, this good news about the resurrection is far more than interesting data about the future. It transforms life in the present by investing it with meaning and hope. Because of their confidence about their destiny, Christians already live a new kind of life. Those who live in the hope of sharing the glory of God are transformed into different people. They can even rejoice in suffering because their lives are motivated by hope. As from John C. Brunt, Resurrection and Glorification in Handbook of Seventh Adventist Theology, page 349. Many people. Pe I'll get that. Okay. Many people have despaired of achieving the kind of relationship with God that promises eternal life. We need to remember the story of the two thieves that, who hung on either side of Jesus. One mocked him, the other, the other asked for salvation. But the background of these two thieves was not the same. Myra? To Jesus, in his agony on the cross, there came one gleam of comfort. It was the prayer of the penitent thief. Both the, both the men who were crucified with, Christ, with Jesus had at first railed on him, upon him, and one under his suffering only became more desperate and defiant but not so with his companion. This man was not, was not a hardened criminal. He had been led astray by evil associations, but he was less guilty than many of those who stood beside the cross re reveling, reviling. reviling the Savior. He had seen and heard Jesus. He had been convicted by his teaching, but he had been turned away from him by the priests and the rulers. Now, so let's stop and think about that for a moment. Here is a man who, who, who heard Jesus. He was convicted. He thought, okay, I should follow him. But then he thought, all the priests and Pharisees are against him. All our leaders, they have been our leaders for years and years and years. How could they possibly be wrong? There must be something about this man that's wrong. And so he turned away from Jesus. Seeking to stifle conviction, conviction, 
he had plundered deeper and deeper into sin until he was arrested, tried as a criminal, and condemned to die on the cross. In the judgment hall and on the way to Calvary, he had been in the company of Jesus. He had heard Pilate declare, I find no fault in him, John 19.4. He had marked his godlike bearing and his pitiful forgiveness pitying. of pitying forgiveness of his tormentors. On the cross, he sees the many great religionists shoot out the tongue with scorn and ridicule the Lord Jesus. He sees the wagging heads. He hears the unbraiding speeches taken, taken up by his companion in guilt. If thou art Christ, save thyself and us. Among the passers-by, he hears many defending Jesus. He hears them repeat the words and tell of his works. The conviction comes back to him that this is the Christ. Turning to his fellow criminal, he says, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? The dying thieves have no longer anything to fear from man, but upon them possesses presses the conviction that there is a God to fear, a future to cause him to tremble, and now, all sin polluted as it is, his life history is about to close, and we indeed justly, he moans, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. From Desire of Ages. Page seven. So here is someone who'd been exposed to Jesus, had been convicted by Jesus, but then he thought, well, no, and he turned back. Would it be better to experience the truth uh, in love and joy that Christ offers throughout our entire lives instead of having a deathbed experience like that thief on the cross? Do we enjoy living with guilt, fear, trouble, and pain without the promises of Jesus? If we really have experienced the wonderful things which Jesus promises. Shouldn't we be excited about sharing the details of those promises with others? Are we doing that? So in this lesson, we've talked a great deal about how it is possible to deal with past sins, how God forgives us and so forth like this. But there was little talk about the universe, wide implications, and I think we need to think about those. You do the same. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these lessons which have challenged us to think clearly through the issues involved in our salvation. May we take them up, may we think about them, and may we let them be a guide to our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.